Woodworking is just plain fun. It's play, and play is an integral part of learning. Every time you make sawdust, it offers you a chance to learn. And when you introduce a kid to the craft, it also offers you a chance to build upon their knowledge and let them experience the importance of education. Today we're going to turn a spinning top, and we'll talk a little bit about leverage, because wood turning is all about leverage. It's an exercise in power, finesse, and control. You're battling the forces of physics and nature, harnessing them to bend to your will with the finesse of just your fingertips. It's all about leverage with wood turning. So let's make a little spinning top. I believe it was Archimedes that said with a long enough lever and a good fulcrum, he could move the world. And that is directly applicable to wood turning because our wood turning tools in effect are a lever and our tool rest is a fulcrum. And a second ago you saw me battling it out with a one and a horsepower motor on this lathe and actually going and defeating it with just my fingertips. Let me explain. The physics behind wood turning is actually kind of simple. What you have is your lever, the woodworking tool, and you have a fulcrum, your tool rest. Well, if you have a lever and you put a fulcrum in the middle, if you move the back of the lever, uh, the front will move an equal distance, just the opposite direction. So if I want to lift something up, if I push down here, I can lift up something of equal weight as the foot pound of pressure I'm putting on the back of the lever. If I want to magnify my power, I can move that uh, left, the fulcrum halfway to the distance. Now when I move up the back of the lever, the front moves up half that distance. If I move up another way, so now I'm about an uh, eighth of the distance, further magnification. So that is why when you wood turn, you want to get the tool rest as close to the wood as possible to give you the most power. The motor I have right here is one and a half horsepower. Now I'm going to do this as just a demonstration to show you what happens. I don't recommend you do it, but we're going to move my fulcrum way out here. So it is about a third of the way through. And I'm just going to lightly touch the wood. I want you to see how much pressure I have to put down here to control it. So here we go. Turn it up. One and a half horsepower motor spinning about 2,000 RPMs. You come up, you ride that bevel. Look at that. Boom, it powers me down. It jerked me up. The power of the motor is a lot more than my weight can handle. And look at here. I'm going to take a photograph and show you that little bit managed to dent this tool rest. That's how much power is being put down into it. It dented a metal tool rest. Now if I move that tool rest all the way from forward as far as I can, as close to that so it's not touching, now look at that pivot point. Way far forward. Now, now when I touch the wood, I can actually control it with my pinky. Easy peasy. I'm dominating a one and a horsepower motor using leverage. So what I just did here is I rounded out a square. Y'all saw it in the opening video and in that I used a roughing gouge. Basically a roughing gouge is what you use in spindle turning, not bolt turning, spindle turning to get the form round so you can start doing it. Once you get it round you can turn up the speed a little bit because the centripetal force is more even. It won't be wobbling as much. And a roughing gouge is straight across the top and generally you have one bevel along the bottom to uh, pivot against and basically you can use that bevel as a second fulcrum to gain control and the next aspect of making this little, uh, little uh, spinning top is that we are going to use a spindle gouge same thing it's got a little scoop in the middle it only goes about half the distance of the rod but the key difference it is round up top okay and generally the rule of thumb is, just like on the roughing gouge, we're going to put the tool on the tool rest to gain the power 
to handle the rotating mass. Also, if you understand the physics a little bit, the closer you get the fulcrum to the mass and the handle back there, more the power of the rotation gets transferred straight down because I'm actually engaging the wood kind of at the 50% mark. But that's a little bit more advanced physics. We're talking mainly about leverage today. Anyways, the idea is whenever I'm going this way on the spindle gouge because it's round, I want to stay on this half of the gouge, uh, of the cutting edge. Whenever I'm going that way, I go on the other half. So you always see the shavings coming off just off center of the direction you're going. If you do it the opposite side, you get to what's called a catch where it would dive in. Uh, it's not big a deal, but you'll see when we're turning. So here we go. I'm going to crank the speed up, get my safety glasses in the right spot, come back over. You can hear me touch the bevel down, and I basically pivot off, and I'm going to make the point of the spinning top first. Now, before what you saw me doing was using levers to control power, because I had to handle the one and a half horsepower motor. Now you see me using leverage for finesse. That's what's so cool about it. You can, you, they can do both at the same time. Uh, beforehand, when you're doing power, that'd be like lifting up a car with a car jack. That's using a lever and a gear. All that works. That's why even the smallest person can jack up the car to change their, their tires. What I'm doing now is using the lever and the fulcrum right off the uh, chisel right here to gain more leverage. So I can gain control and make nice, easy, smooth cuts, perfectly straight. And this would be like a doctor doing brain surgery. You see all those mechanisms where they grab that handle, they're almost doing surgery by robotics now, where their hands can make very large movements on the control, but the knife is actually cut microscopic, or they're probably using a laser but it's making microscopic adjustments on the inside of your brain. So you can use le leverage to not only increase power, but gain control. And what do I mean by control? If you notice, the tip is moving ever so slightly, but my back handle is moving quite a bit. Let me back out and show you. So I'm gonna make one last smoothing cut on this front section right here, and I want you to pay attention to the motion of my back hand. You'll see it moving quite a bit, but because I have the fulcrum so small right here, watch how much little my front finger moves. Uh, the tool's kind of hot, but you get the idea. I can move the back quite a bit. That's what gives me a clumsy oaf like me the ability to do some pretty fine work in turn, spindle turning. So I come up, I'll touch down, and just nice, grab just the slightest shavings coming across, because I have ultimate control. My back hand is barely moving, which means my front, the cutting edge, is even moving less. That is what's so cool about leverage. It gives you finesse. There we go. Nice, smooth cut. Glass smooth. Now, let me show you another quick little side note. Uh, I got glass smooth finish right here, but I do want to put a finish on it to shine it up a little bit more. So I'm going to use beeswax. This is basically just a honeycomb that you stick on the pot, melt down, and get glob of stuff. And right now, this is in a solid state, okay? Now it's kind of, it's like honey soft like that. But we're in room temperature. I'm going to put a very carefully measured amount of this on the tip of the top, because this I'm done with the tip of the top, so I'm gonna go ahead and finish it now. And you have to be very careful, because if you put too much, nothing bad will happen. So I just smeared it on like that. Now, like all matter, I want to turn it into liquid. And all matter can go through three states. We had a solid, we have a liquid, and it can be a gas. Uh, even uh, iron and metals and even helium in the right conditions can turn into a solid liquid and gas. But I want to liquefy that uh, wax so it absorbs into the top layer of the wood. To do that one, I have to heat it up. So to heat it up, I am going to apply friction. I'm going to use the old Boy Scout trick of rubbing two sticks together. Here's one stick, and here's a paper towel. That's the other stick. Theoretically, paper's my wood. And watch what happens when you add heat to it. 
You can see the wax starts to melt. It gets absorbed in the top layer of the wood. And this is an old tiny finish. The Romans used to use this to add a little bit of waterproofing, a little bit of hardness to their finishes. So now I have a glass smooth finish with just a little beeswax and heat. Kind of cool. Glass smooth. Now let's start on the axle at the top, the part that allows you to speed it up to get it going. You notice earlier I was going this way, so I was using this side of my spindle gouge. Now I'm going to be coming in this way, so I'm going to be using that side of the spindle gouge. Also, because I'm coming down towards the center, I need to keep create a ramp to go deeper and deeper and deeper. So I'm going to actually start back here, even though I want it to be straight axle all the way up. So here we go. Notice I come up, I touch the bevel down, it's not cutting at all. I'm pivoting off that bevel to get more leverage to gain control. Once I see a little shaving come off, I know I'm at the cutting angle and I can figure everything out. So there we go, we start cutting. As I get, leverage gives you power and control. And I guess if you think about it, you could say that leverage is what allowed humans to go from being cavemen to the modern day society. Because without leverage, we wouldn't be able to use axes, Achilles, the things that help people throw spears farther or faster to create, to capture wildlife. Uh, even the medical devices, the robots we use today, all depend upon leverage. Notice I'm going that way, I'm using this side of the gouge, and when I come back this way, I use the other side. Shavings come off the side. Can you hear the pitch change in the wood? That's why they make musical instruments out of wood. Wood has a resonance. The thinner the gets, the deeper the tone will get. So, if you notice this, right now is a circle, and there's the center. So the distance from here to the outside is a radius. That is like a gear, like in your car or bicycle or something like that. It just doesn't have the notches on the outside. Me working my tool, if I touch down right here, well, I'm like another gear where this is the center. And the distance from here to me touching the wood is the radius. And this action, spinning clockwise, makes mine want to spin counterclockwise, just like two gears interacting. Well, the deeper I go towards the, this radius, notice my radius increases. So this gear gets smaller while that gear gets bigger. So I can actually, through my fingers, feel the gear ratios of a car, what the, it would be like in the gear ratios of a car, or your back bicycle, or a CVT transmission. It's kind of cool. So real quickly, I'm going to smooth that face up, then add a little wax to it, and then I'll move on to the rest of the shaft. A little bit of vibration there. Smooth out the inside of this little bead I started. And we'll add a little wax to it. Carefully measured amount, because once again, too much will not cause any bad damage whatsoever. But once the shaft gets kind of thin, you can't really put too much pressure on it. So that's why I like to add the wax now. Using my paper, notice I don't wrap it around it. I just lightly press it on one side to create the friction to melt it. That's all I'm trying to do is melt it so it will absorb into the wood. I have a problem when I do this demo outside. I actually get bees coming towards us, especially in the dead of summer. There we go. Let's see what it looks like so far. 
It looks kind of cool. Got a little texture going on. Okay, now let's do the shaft. And the shaft is like the gear ratios of your bicycle. The thinner I make that shaft, the faster you can, the, the faster you can spin the top. Uh, just like the small gear on your, the back of your bicycle is the smallest of them all, allows you to go fastest, allows pedaling go, you to go faster. There we go, so let's add a little wax to it, and then we'll pop it off. Now I do want to try and put a point on this end over here, on this end, that way if you want to, you have a chance of spinning upside down. So I'm going to use a skew chisel to make that last cut. Skew chisel kind of looks like a just a straight chisel. I, use, I generally have a curve on mine, but that's personal preference. And once again, notice how much leverage can allow you to make just the finest cuts. I mean, the back of my hand is moving quite a bit, but the blade is barely moving. There we go. Well, looky there, it works. Now, Newton's first law of motion is something in motion tends to stay in motion. Well, that thing will keep spinning unless something else acts on it. For example, maybe friction from the tip or the friction with the air around it. A lot of people don't consider that one. The second law of motion is force equals mass times acceleration. Well, I want you to look at the design of mine. Did I make a mistake putting that big heavy bead in the middle? Could be. If I put all the weight on the outside, the acceleration on the outside would have kept it spin line. And the third law is all about telekinetic power. So everyone focus, turn backwards. Whoa. Brain power. Newton's third law of motion. You don't agree with me? I'll tell you what, in the comments below, explain to me why that thing spun backwards using third, Newton's third law of motion. Y'all have fun. And remember, it is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Now let's try this one more time. Y'all be safe and have fun.